Hello everybody and welcome back. In this lecture we're going to have a look at snapping. So I have talked quite a bit so far about making sure that the objects that you're creating have whole numbers in them to make them easier to work with and now snapping will really bring that together because we'll be able to bring objects together and snap them to one another or snap them to the underlying grid that you can see which is even more useful. So snapping is not enabled by default, but if we have a look at the top of the screen, you can see the magnet icon and then we've got a drop down next to it. So the magnet icon basically turns snapping on or off and we can also use shift and tab to do that as well. Now, if you have snapping turned on and you go into, uh, let's say, move your object, you'll notice it will snap to the world around and in fact if we have a look at the delta of x y and z that's what dx dy and dz means we can see that they're moving by whole numbers pretty cool if you don't want to move something you can always press escape to come out of it now if i didn't want it snapping i can hold down control while snapping is enabled to turn it off now that's pretty useful now if i turn it off and I'm starting to move something and realize I want snapping turned on, well, I can hold down control again and it will turn it on. So that's a way of toggling it on and off when you're already moving something around. Now, snapping itself won't make any difference to rotation or scale. Those two things are not affected by snapping. Let's have a look at the options underneath the snap to. So we've set it to increment at the moment and it's going to just increment by whatever the grid size is. And one of the best things you can do is actually view your objects again in orthographic mode so we can move them precisely along the X, Y, and Z axes. So if I now turn on my snapping, I can zoom in slightly and I can just press G and lift it up. Now you'll notice there, because I zoomed in, it's actually moving by smaller amounts. Now that is pretty useful and you can move it by even smaller amounts by holding down shift again. But we want to keep things to whole numbers. So make sure you're moving them to places, providing your objects also fit in to whole numbers. Now there is a problem with just having increment turned on without absolute grid snap turned on. If I set this as let's say 0.2 in the X direction, and move around to the front view, see it's shifted slightly to the right. Now if I go ahead and zoom out slightly and try and move it, it will jump by one step increments, which is fine, but notice it's always 3.2, 4.2, 5.2. It's not snapping back to the grid underneath. So we can turn on absolute grid snap and then it will do that. There we go, snap to one, snap to two, snap to three. That's a very useful way of making sure that whatever you're playing with and building actually goes where you want it to. Now there are other types of snapping and they'll become much more useful later on when we're actually dealing with the mesh data themselves. The one that I tend to use a lot otherwise would be vertex where you're able to snap one of the top corners of one object to that of another. But for the moment, we're going to stick with increment because it's very easy to move things into the right location. So let's add in another cube and I can very quickly put it next to this one. And I can add in another cube and put it on top of these two. And you can see here, I've got a stack of cubes. And before long, you can very easily build up a world from this much like Minecraft is built. And if you've ever played Minecraft, it is predominantly just cubes. And you'll be amazed at what you can create by just putting cubes on top of one another in Blender as well, and it looking pretty neat. And I'll show you some of my creations towards the end of the section when we're really gonna put this stuff together. So do practice with snapping turned on. Do check that you've got absolute grid snap turned on for your own benefit whilst you're learning because it does mean that objects themselves are gonna snap logically into places where they are useful. So let's just say I move this at the top here and scale it on the z-axis by two, so it's a bit taller. What do we have here? Well, we've got the beginnings, I don't know, of a factory or something along those lines. By putting primitives together, you can end up with some pretty awesome placeholders. 
Okay, so that leads us nicely onto a challenge. I'd like you to play with snapping and create yourself a little building. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I just want to see what you can create by just moving some of these primitives around. You don't have to use just the cubes. You can use cylinders or whatever you fancy under this list, under the add mesh menu, any of these. Just put them together and see what you could make. And make sure you've got snapping turned on so you can really position things perfectly. Pause the video now and give that a go. Hey everybody, welcome back. So I'm going to have a bit of fun with this. Uh, let's just try a couple of things. And we can use all, the, all of the knowledge we've got so far. I'm going to draw a box around all of these mesh objects and delete them out of the way. Let's go ahead, add in a UV sphere and do the same and add in a torus. Okay, that looks pretty good so far. Let's flatten the torus by scaling it on its z-axis. And I'm just going to pop in 0.1 here. And then I'm going to scale the x and y by maybe 5. I uh, didn't like that. Maybe 3. There we go. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? We've got ourselves a planet. So you can see how very easy it is to just mock up some of these things. Let's make this two instead. Yeah, that, that looks a bit more in proportion. And if you were being precise with a planet like this, maybe you might want to squash it ever so slightly. Oh, that was too much. 0.95. Yeah, there we go. Nice. So we've got ourselves a planet. Let's select both of those and just move them out of the way over here. Excellent. What else can we build? Well, let's go ahead, uh, add in a cube, add in another cube rotate it on the x-axis by 45. Okay, let's look at this from the side. Let's go G, Z and lift that up and then scale it in. Okay, so we've pushed some of the object into itself, but I also scaled it and I didn't want it scaling on all of these axes. I actually wanted it not scaling on the X. Now I can fix that by just setting the scale on the X back to one. So there we go, that's that. And then, ooh, what else do I wanna do here? Let's put a chimney on as well. Let's add ourselves a cylinder. I'm gonna scale that down on X and Y to maybe 0.2. Yeah, that looks good. And the Z by 0.5, make it half the height. And then let's lift it up and pull it to the side, perhaps towards the back slightly. Let's look at it from the top to do this. Zoom in, press the G key. There, how does that look? Yeah, okay, I think that's acceptable. Now, one of the reasons why I've done the object like this is because now I can talk to you about this problem that I see a lot of newcomers to Blender having. There's a very thin line here coming down my model, and there's this horrible hashing here. This is caused by coplanar faces. Coplanar just means they exist on the same plane in the same place in space. And in real life, that doesn't happen. You can't have two surfaces in exactly the same place. In the 3D world, you can. And because they're both in the same place, the render engine, what's rendering everything else so we can see it on the screen at the moment, doesn't know whether this object or this object comes first. And in fact, it cannot make that decision. They are exactly in the same place. So there are a couple of ways you can resolve this. Sometimes it's just a matter of not putting things together and inserting them inside themselves like this. Or we could maybe grab the X scale and set it to 0.99. There we go. It doesn't quite have the same look to it now that we've got this edge around here. But you know what? It's good enough for the moment. Or we could have made it bigger. Or we could change our design so that doesn't happen. And again here, I'm going to change the X location to push the chimney in slightly. There we go. We've solved that problem. And you know what? From this distance, I wouldn't be able to tell. As we get closer, yes, you can. And perhaps if I select this object, we can see it's 1.98. Perhaps I can make it 1.999. And there we go. It's now much, much closer. And we don't, oh, did you see that? We did have some of the rendering artifact there. So let's 
perhaps drop this down to 0.99 itself and hope it doesn't happen again. And when we zoom out, it's definitely not noticeable. And for these placeholder objects, I wouldn't worry too much about this as we can tweak things and just get them looking okay. And that's ideal for placeholders. The final thing I'd want to do with this object here is let's just say lift it up. So I'm going to select all of those objects. Notice I've selected the lamp as well. Didn't want to do that. Let's select them all again. And I'm going to press G, press the Z key and press one. And there we go. It's now sat on the ground and let's press G, Z and lift this all the way up. There we go. So if we look at it like this, we've got a house with a planet in the background. Awesome. How did you guys get on? What did you end up making? I've made a little house and a planet and I'd love to see which creations you made. Which simple object did you go for? Did you make a car? A plane? Spaceship? Perhaps you really went for it and made a castle. I'd love to see it. So make sure you share your work over on the Discord. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. And that's it for this lecture and I'll see you all in the next one.